Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, I like that, man. I sat up here at the front today, and I could hear y'all sing. Oh, y'all sound great this morning. It's wonderful to gather together to worship our God, isn't it? All right, so if, if you're worried that you might have slept through the sermon and woke up at the announcements, you don't worry you didn't. My name's Randall Latham. I'm usually on stage here with my wife doing announcements on a Sunday morning. Uh, but today there's been a scheduling conflict, apparently, so here I am doing the sermon. I'm just kidding. I told Jason many months ago that, hey, if you ever have something that comes up regarding serving, I'm your man. I want to help and do that. And Jason wasted no time in getting me on the schedule to do it. But I'm super glad to be here, super glad uh, to be sharing God's word with you on what it means to serve faithfully. You know, on any given Sunday, we have anywhere between 50 and 60 individuals at this church that are serving. Like, you can see Carol on stage. Man, she did a great job this morning, right? Yeah. But to make that possible, you guys could look back there. We got people running online stuff, our sound, everything like that. You guys are awesome. Yeah. All right, we got people serving coffee. We got people welcoming. We got people, you know, working with small children in the back so that we could be here. All of these things happen to make Sundays possible here. Amen. And we have even more at our Pecola campus as well. And so, and part of that, though, is something I've been a part of for about eight years, all right? And that's our deacon ministry. Guys, we have an amazing deacon ministry here at Cross Community. Like, we do. And and I know I'm a little bit biased because I'm part of that. But guys, we have 17 men and their wives that serve here at this campus. And we have one and his wife at the Pecola campus serving diligently. Now, if you're not familiar with how we do deacons here at Cross Community, like we are not elders. None of us are making decisions, nor do we really want to. All right? We don't want that. We just want to get in the trenches and serve. Okay? And so what happens is that we all we select each other from our, like we, we were already faithful servants beforehand. So like these men were chosen because of what they were already doing. All right? They were already chosen because they were serving faithfully. They were men of good character. Their wives were of good character. And let me tell you, these men, I have have elbow to elbow, we've built uh, fences. We have done wheelchair ramps for people. Um, We have sat in hospitals when we were still allowed to do that um, with families who were dealing with sick people or family members that were even dying. We've prayed with them. We've sat with them. We've cried with them. And these men, man, you will not find a better group of men than these that I serve with. They are just outstanding. Their wives are there to help make meals for people that are going through rough times. Like just, man, you, I can't even begin to name all the stuff that these guys do that we probably never will hear about because we don't like to get it out there in the open. This is what we do. We're kind of like ninja servants, okay? We're just like, we're just doing it, and we don't want the credit, because that's not much, but we're going to talk about that more. It's all for the glory of God, okay? And so when we talk about serving faithfully, though, I mean, I, when I, I talked about it with a few people, and usually what comes to mind are like the big things. You know, we're going to take a week of vacation, and instead of going to Hawaii, we're going to go to... I don't know, somewhere else that's not as tropical, right? We're going to be roofing houses or serving in some way like that. Or we're going to like try to serve in some capacity at church. Well, yes, those are great things. Serving should be a part of our daily lives. It should be as much a part of us as breathing. And we'll see why here in a little bit. And so when we think about serving, this is what serving is. It's to serve, is to perform a duty or service for someone else. Simply all it is. We just do something for someone else. Like, we all know what it means to be served well. We go to a restaurant, we eat the meal, we have a server, and that server, hopefully, is keeping your glass full, is getting the dishes cleaned out, is bringing your food to you, made sure you had the right silverware, all that stuff. Like, I have heard people go to a restaurant, and they, when you do that, you only talk about two things. It's the food and the service. And they'll say, well, the food was, eh, it was all right. The service was amazing. We all talk about that. Yeah. And so, like, I, there are times I've been at a, at a restaurant, and, like, my water got a little bit low or something like that. 
and I turn to talk, and next time I turn around, it's full again. I'm like, whoa, didn't even see the guy or the gal. It's crazy. Like, that's good service, right? But we also know when we've not been served well. Like, you've been sitting around, like, it's been about 20 minutes, no one's taking your drink order or something. Yeah, it, we all know what it feels like to be served well or to not be served well. But serving is just performing a duty or service for someone else. And faithfully. We're talking about serving faithfully. What does it mean to do something faithfully? It's just to do something in a loyal manner. Loyal manner. Like, we don't call it old faithful just because it's the grandest geyser out there. There are other more spectacular geysers. We call it old faithful because you can literally set a watch to it. They do. If you've ever, if you've ever been there, you can see old faithful, and on the wall of, like, the, the lodges right there, it has a big clock, and it's counting down to when it's about to erupt again. Like, that's what it means to be faithful. It's consistent daily activity in doing something. Diligent, consistent workmanship is what it's described as. And I don't think anyone here could argue that Jesus didn't serve faithfully. He did. Jesus served faithfully. And if you're taking notes, we're going to be in John chapter 13 today. All right, I'll give you guys a little bit of time. I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit from Matthew and Luke to help illustrate a point, but we're going to really hammer down on John chapter 13. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus came in the form of a servant, not to be served, but to serve. It's Matthew 20, 28. Okay? Now, one of the greatest examples of Jesus serving is found in John 13. That's why we're here today. I, I, I was really struggling through some of this is because the New Testament, really all the Bible, but the New Testament especially is like, I got to preach the whole New Testament in like 25 minutes because the whole thing, start to finish, is about serving. Uh, you, I mean, Jason preached about you know, abiding and you can't produce fruit if you're not abiding in the... And like he did a couple of weeks ago. I could have done that. I could have done anything else. But really this one right here, I want to hone in on this one. John chapter 13. And so this is where, you know, the Last Supper is occurring and Jesus gets up and he's washing the feet of his disciples. Now, I, I know feet are gross, okay? Like, we don't even like to talk about washing feet. I don't want people touching my feet. For I don't like people touch me really anyways, but especially my feet. I don't even like to wash my own feet, okay? I mean, let me look, they're so far down there, okay? But I don't like to touch my own. I do wash my feet, okay? So before you go, I do wash my feet. But like, we don't, like, we, that's, like our culture is, just, ew, we don't like it. Okay? And, and, and even in their culture, here's, I did a little bit of research on foot washing. I think we're kind of familiar with maybe like the servant or slave washing feet for, for, for some of us. But there are also other examples as well. There was foot washing by wives to husbands. Tiff, we're going to do something new when we get home today. Okay? All right. But this was like a, a sign of respect to the husband from the wife. If you look in um, 1 Samuel, when Abigail is called to be David's wife, her response is, I am ready to serve and wash feet. Okay? This was a thing that they did. Kind of weird, in my opinion, right? For all of us today, but that's what they did. There's foot washing by children to fathers. Brooklyn and Madison, we're going to be doing something different. No? Okay. But this was also a sign of respect for their father. They would wash the feet, the hands, and the face of their father. This is a sign of love and respect for them. There is foot washing by students to rabbis and teachers. Again, this is another sign of respect or a sign of love and affection for their teacher. But then the last one is foot washing by slaves or servants to guests. Now, this was a sign of a show of honor for a guest but it was performed by the lowest person of the household. And so while, yes, it was a sign of respect, the actual task of doing so was done by someone else. It was deemed as a menial, lowly task for someone in the house. In fact, later on, Jewish moral law would state that if you were a Jew and there were other slaves in the house that were not, you didn't have to wash feet because it was deemed that low. 
that someone that wasn't a Jew had to step in and do that role. And so that's where we're at in John 13. But I want to back up just a little bit to before the triumphal entry. All right? So we have in like Matthew 20 talks about before, before they start to enter the city, Jesus had done something. He'd been there speaking or whatever. And the sons, I, I, I'm sorry, sometimes I find humor where maybe humor is not supposed to be found. Okay? I, 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 when I read scripture, I kind of see it as a movie. And with my personality, there's always a little bit of humor injected in there. All right? And so the disciples are standing around and maybe they stopped at like James and John's house. It tells us the sons of Zebedee, their mom, okay, brings them with them and comes to Jesus and asks if one could sit at the right and one at the left in heaven. All right, first off, if I'm sitting around with 11 of my best bros that I've been hanging out with Jesus for the last three years and two of their moms come out and ask Jesus, if, my, if their boy, if or her boys could be at his right and left hand, I'm making fun of those two guys. Right? Mama's boy! Yeah! Woo! Gotta have your mama come down and ask if Jesus can, you know, if you can sit next to him. Like, I'm serious, guys. I'm making fun of them. And the Bible tells us, like the other disciples, they get indignant. Like, it starts kind of a little argument with them right there. And Jesus tells them, you know, he kind of gets them to quiet down. He's like, listen... Greatest is least, least is greatest, all right? Then the triumphal entry happens, okay? We know what happens there. People are cutting down palm leaves. Jesus is riding in. But don't forget, the disciples are there with them. They're walking behind them into Jerusalem to where they're going to have the Last Supper. And he sent a couple ahead to get the room prepared. And he asked a guy that's carrying a jug of water. There's going to be a guy with a jug of water. Go ask him to prepare the room. Like, okay. I don't know, if I'm a guy carrying a jug of water and two random dudes come up to me and just ask me, hey, prepare the room. I'm going to be like, for who? But apparently this guy knew or something. He just did it. And so they got the room prepared. And then they're sitting there eating. But there's an important detail that is left out. They're eating this meal and none of their feet have been washed. In Jewish culture, this would have been the first thing that happened before sitting down for a meal. You would never sit down and eat a meal without washing your feet. For one thing, we don't, they didn't have paved roads like we do here. They were very dusty. It was like driving down an Oklahoma back road in summer. We're like, you might want to go with the windows down, but you want to be the first car in line if you do it, because it's, woof. You want to try to do that? Get the sun, you're breathing, it's awful. So it was super dusty. Also, they had animals in the street, y'all. Animals aren't very selective about where they do their business, okay? And so they're walking in all of this stuff, and their feet are nasty. Nasty. You can see why people wouldn't want to do it. Like, my feet are nasty, and they're in shoes and socks all day. I can't imagine walking in sandals and going through cow yuck and all that, okay? It's just gross. And so... It had to have been a, a thing between the disciples looking around like, look, we're kind of halfway through this meal and no one's washed feet yet. But they've already tried to determine who's going to be the greatest in heaven. They've been arguing about it. And for one of them to step forward and to wash feet, man, that's automatically going to peg them as the least. And, it, and, and Luke tells us that this argument starts up again. Like, we might have this picture of the Last Supper as like the Leonardo da Vinci painting where they're all reclining at the table, and it looks kind of serene and calm. But Luke tells us that this argument starts back up again. Like, they weren't done. And they start arguing again about who's going to be the greatest. And I, I don't know what might happen during this time, I don't know what might have been said. I can imagine Mama's boy might come out again at this point. I don't know. As they're bringing up stuff from the past, trying to one-up everyone else. But it's at this point that Jesus rises from his spot at the table and he walks over 
takes his robes off and ties a towel around his waist. Man, that may not sound like a big deal, but what Jesus did right there is that he made himself look like a slave. Where his disciples were arguing about who's going to be greatest, who's going to be better than who, I'm not washing your feet because I'm going to be better than you. Jesus stands up, removes his robes, ties a towel around his waist, literally looks like a slave, the lowest of the low, and he kneels. He kneels. And he begins to wash their feet. Guys, mm, tearing up. Mm. So the disciples were arguing about who was greater. But there wasn't a single one of them that wouldn't have said that Jesus wasn't greater. Jesus was number one for them. There was no argument among them. Jesus was number one. And yet number one bowed down and washed their feet like a slave. Not only was this a humbling act that would have put the disciples' argument about who is greater to rest, it was a foretaste of what was yet to come. The humbling and humiliating act of the crucifixion. Man, so how in the world, how in the world do I have this kind of love to serve others? Man. How do you do it? Like, I can't do it on my own power. That's for sure. Because my flesh is lazy. I want people to serve me. I want you to go do this for me. Or, I'm kind of prideful. I don't want to step down off my pedestal sometimes, y'all. Nor do I want to accept help from anyone. Man, sometimes servants, y'all the hardest people to serve. Guilty as charged right here. We'll get more into that. So for us to be able to serve faithfully in this capacity, we've got to love God, obviously. But guys, we've got to love others like ourselves. I'm really good at taking care of me. I am very good at taking care of me, making sure that my meals are prepared, my bed's made, all that stuff. I'm really good at taking care of me. I need to be really good at taking care of you just as well as I take care of me. You got to be humble. The second thing. You got to be humble. You cannot serve if you're not humble. Because like Jesus, humbling himself to disrobe and to put on the outfit of a slave, that's a humbling activity, guys. You've got to have humility. And neither of these can be accomplished without abiding in Christ. You can't do it. You might be able to serve for a little bit, but eventually, man, if you have pride, you're going to get bitter. Man, I serve these people all the time and I don't even get a thank you. Mm. I can tell when pride seeped into my life because um, sometimes that happens. Being very honest, sometimes serving people is a hard thing to do because they're not always grateful. They don't always see what happens. But that's not the point. It's not the point. So 
so their pride can keep them from serving well, or their lack of value. Like, I'm not worthy to be served. I'm not worthy to serve. It's self-deprecating. It's false humility. False humility. Both of these can be remedied by adjusting our identity in Christ. You commit daily. You've got to learn about Jesus, y'all, and how we're to live. We've got to gather consistently. Man, my small group knows me. Like, I hang out with these guys. They're like, dude, uh, tone down the pride a little bit this week, okay? And my wife's really good at that, okay? She, like, I'm with this woman all the time. She knows me. She knows when I'm starting to get a little off kilter, like Mr. Bible Studies of this week, huh? No, she's really gracious about it, though. My small group is gracious about it, but without these people, I'm just going to be like, just doing my own thing because I'm going to be blind to that stuff a lot of the times. I think I'm doing great, and everyone's like, man, you're doing awful. Clean your act up. So we got to gather consistently as well. So that people, we, that's what this is all about, you know, gathering together. So we can all follow Christ well and do well. So who do we serve? In a word, everyone. Let me break it down. One of the easiest and best places to start is our families. Husbands, we got to be serving our wives. Wives, we need to be serving our husbands. Kids, same thing. One of the best ways, though, is showing our kids how to serve. We can harp on people all the time. You need to serve, you need to serve, you need to serve, you need to serve. But if we're just barking that off and not doing it ourselves, it's going to fall on flat ears, guys. We need to be taking our kids with us, showing them what it looks like to follow Christ and serving others. So our family. Let me tell you, my wife, if y'all have never met her, she's, she's, a, really, <laughs> she's, a, she's a really special lady. But when we got married, uh, we, we divvied out some household chores, okay? And if you've ever met my wife, you would understand this real quick about why I take out the trash, okay? She doesn't like it. And she made it abundantly clear when we were first married and we'd moved all of our stuff and pff, all of our, our CD collections got merged together, CDs are little discs for those younger people. You would put music on them, okay? Um, but that was a big deal when you merge CD collections, you got married. But when we, when we got married and we moved in, it was abundantly clear she was not touching the trash. She just wasn't. She didn't do trash. She didn't like trash. She's not doing it. I'm like, okay, fine, I can handle that. Just take a bag out. It's fine. You know when one of the most... This, this, one of the sweetest moments ever is when I'm caught up with work or I'm out of town or something and I come back and the trash has been taken out. That was her serving me in those capacities. That's what it looks like to serve in your family. And we have the church. We're all here today. We've talked about our volunteers and stuff, you know, in the coffee bar and in the back and on stage and everywhere. And so th this is another great place to serve. Like we're supposed to serve the church. I mean, this is known. It, it, and we're going to talk more later during announcements, but if you want to serve, we got areas to do that. But this is a great place to do it. We need volunteers all the time. This does not happen without volunteers, without people who are willing to serve. And so we need to be involved in that. Next is our friends and our coworkers, like our community, basically, pretty much everyone else. I mean, I, okay, there, we, all go, we all have jobs, we go to jobs and things like that, and there are just tasks at work that no one wants to do. I don't know what it is with copy paper, but my first job out of college, no one wanted to fill the copy paper. It was like a, this is a, this is a nonprofit organization, it was like people printing things off all the time, and I would inevitably, inevitably go into the copy room Push print out of paper. Like that's so. It's just put paper in the copier. It's all you gotta do. So I did, and then like eighty people's stuff would print out before my stuff ever did because no one changed the paper, right? 
it's just simple stuff like that. No one wants to do it. It might be deemed a lowly task at work. Just put the copy paper in the, in the copier. That's one way that you can serve. The, you might say, it's not my job. Jesus wasn't a slave. We'll just say that. Now, the last one, though, is the toughest. Jesus himself, even earlier, had talked about, like, I mean, it's easy to love people that are easy to love. Even sinners do that, right? Even sinners love people, like the people that are like them, their family, friends. But this last category is our enemies. Of the 12 disciples that Jesus washed the feet, he already knew that Judas was going to betray him. It tells us that. In verse 11, for he knew who was going to betray him. Yet he still washed Judas' feet. He still washed his feet, y'all. And he knew what Judas was about to do. I don't know about y'all, but serving people who have hurt me or hurt my family is not a natural thing that I want to do. It's not. If anything, I want to inflict the same harm and pain on them that they did to me or my family. If I'm speaking honestly and openly. And Jesus demonstrates right here, that's not what following Christ is all about. Where it's easy to go in and love my friends, love my family, love those people that are easy to love. Man, Jesus says, no, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg there. You got to love your enemies. You got to wash their feet too. And I don't know what that looks like for everyone. There's a million and one different ways that we can wash people's feet, especially those of our enemies. But how we do that is that we understand who Christ is and what he did for us. When we understand who Christ is, what he did for our salvation, and what he's promised us in heaven, serving becomes more than something we're obligated to do. Serving becomes a privilege. We're able to serve others because Christ first served us. We're willing to give up a few hours now because he's promised us an eternity later. We serve for the glory of God. You know, Colossians tells us whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it for the glory of God. There it is. It doesn't matter what we do. We've got to do it for the glory of God because that's why we're here. If, if God is not the treasure in the field that we're willing to sell everything to go and get, we're missing the point. We're missing the point. Christ has to be greater. That's the only way I'm going to step across the aisle and serve and love someone who wronged me. You want to see a picture of grace on earth? Like we've already got it from God sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Like I can't earn that. There's not enough works and, goods, and good deeds that I can do that's going to be a salvation. I can't earn my way into heaven. No, the only way that happened is because of God's grace on me the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
But you want to see that in action on earth? Go serve someone who doesn't deserve it. You hurt me, and it was wrong, and it's still wrong, but I love you. I love you, and I'm going to serve you. That's grace in action. They don't deserve it. Serving opportunities become some of our greatest witnessing and gospel sharing opportunities. It is. Because the world's not going to be like, why in the world is this dude serving me right now? I totally backstabbed him to get this job, right? That's what the world's going to say. Our response needs to be, because Jesus. Because Jesus. I'm doing this for God's glory. I'm serving you because I love you. Because Christ loved me enough to die for me on a cross. So, I'm the product of two art teachers, y'all. I do. I come from a family of educators. Um, my mother graduated college with an art history degree, with an emphasis on Native American studies. All right. She was a middle school art teacher for like 140 years or something. I don't know. It seemed like forever. All right. Um, so she was, she, was a, she was an art teacher. She taught. And she was not like your typical art teacher. Um, a lot of art teachers, I mean, you have like the typical, we're going to do watercolor and stuff like that. Like, no, my mom had a kiln in her classroom, glazing and firing pottery. Like, they, they, they basket weaving, okay? My summers were spent playing baseball and visiting art museums. That was my summer. Y'all can feel sorry for me, just a tad. Honestly, I kind of like the art museums. I like them now. Not so much when I was 12. So that was my mom. Like, our, she, she painted. She, uh, she did charcoal. I was in charcoal. I, I did all kinds of stuff with my mom like that. Needlepoint, she quilted. If it was crafty, she did it. My dad. My dad is on the other end of the artsy, crafty spectrum, where mom is, like, making clothes and paintings and all this. My dad is over here. And he graduated with a drafting arts degree, okay? Those people are like drawing blueprints and things like that. And so while, it's very artsy, very technical. So while mom is teaching art over here, dad's teaching drafting classes. I can remember before he got moved into tech ed where it was like all computer and auto generated and stuff like that. Um, he had drafting tables. They would lift up and the students, he's teaching draft with a compass and all that. So both of them very artsy people, and y'all might be wondering, like, wow, Randall, what, what, what did you get out of that? Sarcasm. I got sarcasm out of that. I am a little bit artsy, but no. So you can imagine I have two parents that are very artsy, very talented, and like dad can draw cartoon characters. Yogi Bear was one of his favorite ones. Hey, boo-boo. He loved to do cartoon stuff like that. So when the Pictionary came out, that was like one of their favorite games on game night. And I was like, oh my gosh. Guys, my friends couldn't even write their name, okay? My friends would come over, and I literally, he was so smart. It's like penmanship, who cares? I don't care. That was kind of like what he was. He would write his name, and it looked like Sanskrit, all right? And, you know, sc sc scratches everywhere. And that would, he would be like, he would be my partner. And so Pictionary would come out. We'd, you, if you're not familiar with Pictionary, it's the worst game ever. You have this thing, you, you, it, it's... It's a box, and it comes to you, and you lift it, and it's got these cards, and you draw a card, and the person that's drawing is supposed to, like, you know, read the card, I'm like, oh, I got this, put the card back, and then they take the world's smallest pencil, because I guess they were trying to save money on this, smallest pencil, and you're supposed to draw what's on the card before the little timer, the little hourglass runs out. While you're drawing, your teammates are screaming at you from over here, trying to guess what you're drawing. Now, as you can imagine, my parents are drawing the Mona Lisa. 
My friend's struggling to spell his name, okay? It was awful. I hated the game. So what happens is that, like, my friend would draw it. He'd look at it like, oh, yeah. Toad's got this, Randall. We're on it, okay. The other team would flip the, you know, the hourglass over, and my buddy would draw a couple of circles. And then I'm over here, and I'm like, okay. Two circles. Uh, wheels. Bikes on, you know, wheels. And he's like, what? No. And it's about this point that the tapping begins. You take the world's smallest pimple. Because that's going to activate the brain cells in my head or something, right? And so I'm like, okay, no, not wheels. Uh, but but uh, wheels on the bus go round and No, not, okay, it's not wheels. Uh, ooh, ooh, pancakes. It's pancakes. And you're not supposed to talk when you're the drawer. And you're like, and it gets more frantic. And you're like, okay, not pancakes, eggs and bacon. Bacon, no, sausage, sausage. And like, and you just start screaming. And then it's like, and he's like the, the thing gets more frantic. And he's like going at it. Like, and I'm like, can't you draw something else? And he's over here like, I shouldn't have to. It just, and then finally the time runs out. After words are said and furniture is thrown, finally calms down. And I'm like, what was it? And you're like, dude, isn't it obvious? It's Chuck Norris. <laughs> okay, you guys, why am I talking about Pictionary? Because when we live a life as followers of Christ and we aren't serving, it's like we're drawing two circles on a piece of paper and trying to tell it's Jesus. Serving needs to be as much a part of our life as breathing. It's who we are. As followers of Christ, we are called to serve. We are called to love people. Lost my place now. You see, the foot washing thing was not just a special occasion kind of thing. This happened all the time. It would have happened as soon as someone entered the home. It was a very mundane and ordinary task. When we serve, it's most likely going to be through the mundane and the ordinary. Yes, there are going to be those moments where we get to go on a mission trip and build an entire house for someone in two days. I don't know. But we're going to, the opportunities to serve day in and day out are endless. They are there. And I don't know if that's taking the trash out for your spouse. I don't know if that's offering a kind word to the lady or the guy that's giving you your coffee. I don't know if it's just putting copy paper in a copier. But when we serve, it's most often going to be through the mundane and the ordinary. Serving is also sacrificial. It's going to cost you something, most likely your time. You see, when the disciples were bickering and arguing about who is greatest among them, they were also vying for who's going to serve them. Because if you're the greatest, that means someone else has to wash your feet. But Jesus flips that and turns it on its head. Jesus sacrificed his position where they should have been washing his feet and showed us a different way. So also in not just your time, you might be sacrificing your position, your status. Yeah, it's not glamorous at times. It's not always going to be the prettiest thing or even the most culturally acceptable. But to serve well means that we take the lowest rung on the ladder. Serving lets us know that I consider their needs more important than mine. And like we talked about earlier, serving must glorify God. We should never take any of the credit. 
there's been a story coming out of Alabama. Some of you may have heard about it, <clears throat> about this man named Hody Childress. Now, Hody was a small-town farmer, an Air Force veteran on a fixed income. But on the first of every month, he would walk into Geraldine Drugs in the small town of Geraldine, Alabama, and hand owner Brooke Walker a folded-up $100 bill. Walker said he first came in about 10 years ago and asked if anyone ever came in and couldn't pay for their prescription, and she answered that, yeah, it happened quite often. And so it was then that he gave her the first of many $100 bills. Walker said, Hody uh, said, don't tell a soul where the money came from. If they ask, just tell them it's a blessing from the Lord. He also asked not to tell him who the money went to, just to use her judgment about who needed it. Hody faithfully gave his anonymous donation every month until last year when he became too weak to make the trip personally. At that point, he finally confided in his daughter about his monthly donation and asked her to take it on his behalf. He died on New Year's Day at the age of 80, and his daughter shared about his anonymous good deeds at his funeral. Since then, several people, several people have come forward telling the family how his donations had helped him over the years. I'm sure some of you have been the recipient of some kindness. I'm, I like to do revisionist history sometimes, and I often like to look back over my own life and wonder where I would be were it not for the few individuals that invested in my life. I can remember when I was in middle school, my parents didn't go to church, y'all. They did early on, but they kind of fell away. And in middle school and, and early high school, I couldn't drive, didn't have a license. And there were some high school students. And I lived out of town. And there were some high school students that sacrificed their time and their gas dollars that they worked hard to put in that tank to come out and pick me up and take me to church. I don't know if I'd be here on a stage today were it not for the efforts of some of those high schoolers like that or a family in college who took me into their home along with <laughs> several dozen other college students and loved on us. Jesus later... comes out and says in verse 34 after he's already washed, his, washed all the disciples' feet he says a new command I give you love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another another. The world is going to know that we're disciples of Christ based on how we love other people, y'all. And like Jesus has said earlier, like it's really easy to love people we like. They're easy to get along with. It's, it's a whole lot harder to love people that are rough around the edges, that have wronged us, that are a little bit different than us, that look a little bit different than us. We have to be willing to set all that stuff aside and love people, y'all. We're going to have a short invitation. Carol makes her way up. I would ask you to think about the ways that you can begin serving in your family, here at the church, at your workplace, community, your neighborhood. And this is the hard one about those who have wronged you.
this is how the world is going to know what it's like to be a follower of Christ. We have to love other people. Man. And it's not like Jesus didn't do it before us, y'all. He gave us the example. It's not like he was resting back on his throne and saying, go do it. No, Jesus did it first. And it's because of that that I'm able to step in and be like, look, I love you. I want to serve you. And so today is the lights dim. Carol plays a verse or seven. Be praying through that. Lord, how can I serve? Where can I serve? Who can I serve?